give you my full title. I'm Mike Kane. I'm the Member of Parliament for Women, Shore and Say Lease, and I'm a, a trustee for the last 12 months or so of Initiatives to Change, having a relationship that's gone back at least 10 or 11 years um, before I became a Member of Parliament uh, and was working out of this building through Movement for Change with David Miliband. So good evening, everybody. And you are, whether you're joining us here in person or the many people who are joining us uh, online uh, tonight, it's a real pleasure to welcome you all. Now, tonight is an opportunity to get to know the founder of our organisation, uh, Frank Buckman, better by analysing his friendship with Robert Schumann, a man widely regarded as one of the founding fathers of the European Union. Over the course of a friendship which lasted more than a decade, these two men made vital contributions to post-World War II reconstruction and peace building. Each drew on the inspirational ideas of the other in the process. I don't intend to dive too deeply into the sorts of ideas and values Schumann and Buckman exchange. The two experts here sitting be beside me are well versed in the details of their thoughts and politics and Christian democracy in general, and I don't want to tread on their toes in any way. However, I would like to talk a bit about uh, Schumann's importance to me uh, and this great charity that I'm a trustee of. As Lord Glassman and Dr. Bouvier will set out, Schumann is significant for a number of different reasons. Personally, I first encountered him because of my interest in Catholic social teaching. This is a body of principles by which people of faith are encouraged to live their lives. <coughs> it advises us to respect the common good, to care for creation, to uphold the innate dignity of each human individual and to stand in solidarity with those facing oppression many of the principles that this organisation espouses. Robert Schumann was not just a strong supporter of these values, through his primary role in the foundation of the European Coal and Steel community, which later developed into the European Union, he was an active contributor to them. After all, the European Union has been crucial in preventing the re-emergence of war involving the whole continent since World War II, saving the lives of countless millions along the way. Arguably, it's one of the most substantial institutional commi commitments to world peace ever. And we are a charity dedicated to peace. Maybe it's not surprising then that Pope Francis and the Catholic Church are actively considering Schumann's case for canonization. He was awarded with an official title, Servant of God, in 2021, and as this has set him on the path for beatification and sainthood. Like Frank Buckman, Schumann was an exceptionally devout man. He envisaged his attempt to change the world and to promote peace as extensions of his faith. Schumann's story, then, is intimately connected to the history of initiatives of change at both a personal and organisational level. The exchange of values and ideas he carried, carried out with Buckman was, deeply in, was a deeply enriching process. It was not for nothing that Schumann regarded his visit to Coe in 1953 as one of the greatest experiences of his life, he said. Arguably, it was at Coe where the alignment between his values and Buckman's found its highest expression. This leads me on to what I think is the most important aspect of this evening's event, widening our understanding of Schumann's relationship with Initiatives for Change will help us to carry out our essential missions today. This history gives us a sense of our grounding philosophy and the distinction of the individuals we have interacted with over the years. I hope that this event, by drawing attention to our history, will enable us to return to our work of international trust building, reconciliation, spiritual renewal, with ever-increasing enthusiasm. Thank you very much. Now, without further ado, we have two great speakers tonight. Uh, I stand in awe of um, Dr. Philip Babaye, who... Um, spent a decade of his life giving service as chair of initiatives uh, for change uh, which we are very grateful for born in oxford a reader in uh, modern european history uh, and re recently retired from the university of kent what moisturizer do you use philip <laughs> uh, i would like uh, to know after this meeting uh, a specialist in russian history and affairs and my notes also say you speak russian as well i, I do that's fantastic I do, yeah. um married with family living in canterbury 
Uh, Philip, you're welcome to take the floor. Thank you so much for your, this contribution tonight. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mike, and uh, great to meet you here, Morris, and nice to see you all and those of you online. So, Franco-German reconciliation post-1945 uh, is one of the great achievements of modern European diplomacy. As many here know, Robert Schuman played a central role in it. The Schuman plan of May 1950, drawing on Jean Monnet's ideas of putting uh, the, the, the West German and French coal industries under one authority, was a crucial element in that process. I'm not going to focus on the plan itself, but on a little known aspect of Schumann's life, his link in the late 1940s and early 50s with Frank Bookman. Now, Bookman uh, was an American Lutheran pastor with Pennsylvania Dutch roots, who in 1938 had launched a movement known as Moral Rearmament, or MRA for short, now known as Initiatives of Change. The number of interactions between Bookman and Schumann was not huge, but they were significant enough for Schumann to be awarded just a few weeks after the Schumann plan was launched, the Chevalier of the Legion of Honor of France for his contribution to Franco-German understanding. And he was later honored by Germany as well. As I will explain, Bookman's contribution lay not exactly at the political level but in the somewhat Im Im unmeasurable sphere of personal encouragement and relationship building, and in work to address the poisonous legacy of history through the overcoming of hatred. Schumann was drawn to MRA's work by two things. First, it had a record of trying to tackle industrial conflict through encouraging dialogue between management and trade unions. Its emphasis here on social unity resonated with Schumann. Schumann, of course, was an admirer of social Catholic social teaching about justice and fairness and the ideas of the political thinker Jacques Maritain, who I guess Maurice may, may touch on. Secondly, MRA had made deliberate efforts to bring people from France and Germany together at its conference centre at Caux sur Montreux. Uh, uh, in, uh, in Switzerland, founded in 1946. Thousands of French and Germans came to Co in the late 1940s, including many members of the French and German governments. The visitors included the soon-to-be German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer, who came with his family and secretaries in September 1948. Now, Co was a place where private, off-the-record conversations across ethnic and social divisions were encouraged. French philosopher Gabriel Marcel, who visited Co at the end of, in the middle of the 50s, used the term intersubjectivity, there's a good long word, uh, to describe the encounters that resulted from these uh, meetings. All this was underpinned by a spirituality emphasizing the value of silence and contemplation for problem solving at both personal and social levels. Silence can be the regulator of men and nations, Bookman once said. MRA's work in industrial relations came to Schumann's attention when he was Prime Minister of France in 1948, and he said he wanted to meet Bookman. The two of them then met the following year, with Schumann now Foreign Minister, firstly briefly in August, and then more significantly in October, at a dinner party hosted by an industrialist from Lille, Louis Bouquet. The details of their dinner conversation are worth dwelling on. Schumann was in a low frame of mind. He told Bookman that in his aspirations for building a better Europe, he felt isolated, even from the French Prime Minister Georges Bidot. Perhaps for this reason, he floated with Bookman the idea that he might retire to a monastery to write his memoirs. He'd always been drawn to the contemplative life, Schumann. So this is already striking. He's right at the heart of French politics, former prime minister, foreign minister, dialogues with Germany, and he's not sure quite whether he's in the right place. 
Bergman asked Schumann, what do you think in your heart you should do? He replied, of course I know I must stay where I am. And he went on to say that he was from the disputed region of Lorraine and had grown up as a German. Uh, he'd actually been born in Luxembourg and grew up speaking both Luxembourgish dialect of German and French. He said, I know the problems and mentality of both countries. I've known for a long time I have a big part in ending the hatred between France and Germany. Bookman endorsed this and provided reassurance, saying, yes, you must stay where you are. Under God, that is your place. So we can see from Schumann's background that he was an obvious person to be a bridge builder. He's been called a border person, a frontier person. His upbringing gave him a natural understanding of the issues. But it seems that he still had to overcome something inside himself to carry out his vocation. Schumann also told Bookman at the dinner that he did not know who to trust in the new Germany, adding that he'd only just met Adenauer, Konrad Adenauer, the now German Chancellor. Bookman replied that there had been some excellent Germans visiting the co-conferences and he would give him a dozen names. Schumann said he'd look them up. Here again, Bookman offered reassurance. Dialogue with Germans was possible if he knew who to talk to. Schumann was delighted with the dinner. As he was leaving, he wrote in Bouquet's a visitor's book that it had been a treasured first step towards visiting Co. Moving on from the dinner, Bookman also had an impact on Schumann's thinking. Schumann had agreed to write the foreword to the French edition of, the, of Bookman's speeches. Uh, there we are, they're called Remaking the World, or Refaire le Monde in French, which came out in the spring of 1950. So Schumann got to work on his preface to this in February 1950. Between a visit to Bonn in January, an important visit to Bonn, and the launch of the Schumann plan itself in May. A sort of intuition came to me through that book, he said. I saw new perspectives opening before me. What could he have meant by this? Importantly, he saw in Bookman's work a practical approach to dealing with hatred. He said he would have been sceptical if Bookman had been offering a new scheme or theory. But no, he saw something different, what he called a philosophy of life applied in action. And he declared in the preface that a school was needed where Christian principles could be deployed to the overcoming of prejudices and hatreds. He commended Bookman for his work in trying to overcome fratricidal hatred. Now, dealing with hatred had, in fact, been a central theme in a speech Bookman had delivered the previous year, entitled The Answer to Crisis. In this book, in this uh, speech, Bookman cited the example of a senior politician who'd had a fierce hatred of the British. So strong, apparently, that it could flash to white heat. But, Bookman explained, the man had learned that an honest apology could lead to an honest peace. And civil war in his country had been averted. Now, this talk of overcoming hatred and averting civil war would undoubtedly have resonated strongly with Schumann. Indeed, the idea of overcoming division, I mean, it was a widely discussed theme in European politics, but the idea of overcoming division was to feature in the early part of the text of the Schumann plan, with Schumann emphasising the need there to eliminate the age-old opposition between France and Germany. There was also a transnational element in Bookman's thinking that would have appealed to Schumann. Bookman often talked about bringing people together from different countries, and, and the value of supranational um, links. This was language familiar to, to Schumann, who had helped to launch the Council of Europe in 1949 with talk of the need for a supranational association of countries. Both Schumann and Bookman were also interested in strengthening democracy through grounding it in a culture of moral integrity. In his preface, Schumann said, 
democracy and her freedoms can be saved only by the quality of the men who speak in her name. Now, Bookman would have endorsed that. He tended to think that supporting constructive personalities was vital to the resolving of national conflicts. Indeed, he clearly saw Schumann as such a constructive personality. France is safe in your hands, he wrote to Schumann at one point. Now, I guess some might say that there was something rather simplistic in suggesting that democracy is best served by honest and constructive personalities. But in the context of the time, this was very relevant and even ideological. The Stalinist ideology and, and, and propaganda, so much of a threat at the time, sought very systematically to leverage popular grievances and social division as a way of spreading Soviet communism. Let's also not forget the international situation in those early months of 1950. NATO had just been established, China fell to communism at the end of 1949, and the Korean War was about to break out in the spring of 1950. In this context, you can see that overcoming hatred in Europe was something of global significance. Yet, everything was still in the balance in the early months of 1950, even the relationship with, between Schumann and Adenauer. The cause of this was the unresolved status of the Tsar region, which had been incorporated into Germany through a plebiscite in 1935. Now, Germany may have lost the war, but Germans remained touchy about losing their territory. Adenauer thought that Schumann was not committed to France's reclaiming the Tsar. So when in March 1950, France moved to absorb the Saarland region, he was furious. He told some of Bookman's colleagues who visited him in Bonn, Schumann is a liar. Even Bidot, the French Prime Minister, lets me call him a lying Alsatian peasant. The two men may have had a shared common Catholic heritage, but this was not in itself enough to eradicate fear and suspicion. If the question for Schumann was who on the German side could be trusted, so it was the same for the Germans. And one senses that Schumann was himself sometimes inscrutable and hard to read. In short, there was plenty of room for peace-building efforts to be derailed by gut instincts of irritation and reaction. Interestingly, when some of Bookman's team suggested to Adenauer that he think how he might be able to change Schumann, Adenauer replied to the effect that he needed to change more himself. There was a self-checking quality in Adenauer there, perhaps arising from the ideas he'd encountered in Co. Bookman tended to say that if people wanted to see a change in the world, the best place to begin was themselves. He also said, in one of his 1948 speeches, union is the grace of rebirth. This meaning that he thought reconciliation came as a fruit of people's experiencing a change of heart and a redirection of motive. And Adenauer was echoing that. Now it should be said that there were other currents at work encouraging a spiritual unity between these men. Schumann, Adenauer, and the Italian leader Alcide de Gasperi had a prayer retreat at a Benedictine monastery before signing the Treaty of Paris a year later. Schumann eventually came to Co in September 1953 and on leaving he made some impromptu comments that reinforced the sense that he at times wrestled with a certain scepticism in his own character. I leave in a spirit no noticeably different from the one in which I came here, he said. Adding, I've been in politics for 34 years and during that length of time one learns to be sceptical. I'm leaving with much less scepticism than when I came. On leaving, he asked Bookman if he could help the French with some of the issues in Morocco where tensions around decolonization were very high. That is a separate story but one where Bookman's peace-building instincts were also deployed to some effect. Some concluding points. 
Bookman played a discreet role in reassuring Schumann about his vocation and in encouraging him to believe that a pathway existed out of hatred into a different kind of Europe. The great spiritual advisors from the Christian denominations I am familiar with have tended to make the individual soul the focus of their concerns. Bookman was also trying to do a personal work, but with an outward-facing approach. This required him and his team to understand the political landscape in which people like Schumann were operating in. The fact that, pe that Bookman knew people on both sides of the conflict and had no political agenda of his own meant he could be useful to men like Schumann and Adenauer. Um, let's see, we've got a couple more photos. There we are. So there is Schumann and um, Bookman in Co. in 1953. Um, and then, yeah, so the next one, the, the Jean. Uh, so the, the dinner party that took place in October 1949 points to the place of hospitality in Bookman's approach. In his links with MRA, Schumann was made to feel at home both at the dinner in October 1949 and then during his visit to Coe in 1953. It may sometimes be true that when people are relaxed, they are more creative. MRA was not alone in using hospitality in this way. This summer I visited the Jean Monnet house outside Paris and I was struck by the fact that uh, apparently many of Monet's most important conversations happened in the relaxed setting of his living room, uh, seen in the picture. Bookman was not operating alone. Although the leader of MRA, he was in fact coming into a work already being done by others. The industrialist Louis Bouquet was one. Uh, another, seen here, inclu others included the Swiss diplomat um, Philip Motu, who had links with the German resistance um, and was one of the founders of Co. The French socialist on the right, uh, Irene Law, a woman embittered by the German occupation and who'd had a life-changing encounter with Germans in Co in September 1947. And in the middle there, uh, the French engineer, Michel Santis, who was Bookman's go-between with Schumann and in some of his interactions with uh, the Catholic Church. Schumann seems to have observed this communal, the communal character of this work because in his preface he called for teams of trained people, apostles of reconciliation. A general point might be made. A solution to a political program may in theory exist, but for it to come into being a network of relationships is needed to make it possible. One historian writing about the events I've just described said, because relationships of trust had been built, the opportunity was not missed. A lesson might be that at times of crisis, a, trans a transnational network of constructive relationships can help steer a situation in a new direction. More on the spirituality. There was in Bookman's approach an assumption that the grace of God flows more freely where there is unity. In 1949, he wrote to a senior German politician to the effect that answers to seemingly insoluble problems could be found when people tried to get a common mind under the guidance of God. He meant by this that an enhanced sense of vision was sometimes the outcome of a deeper kind of teamwork, as well as of people's listening to what the Jewish scriptures call the still small voice. A connected point. Drawing on the story of Franco-German reconciliation and other similar episodes, some American scholars have observed that religion can sometimes play a healing role in diplomacy when it is able to engage with the emotional stakes of the parties and encourages them to draw on their deepest spiritual convictions. Finally, the, the story of Franco-German reconciliation and some of the things I've been talking about illustrate that a resolution to a problem can sometimes only happen when a psychological breakthrough has taken place. Schumann's chief of staff, Robert Rochefort, cites Schumann as saying, 
in order to, in order to advance, we had to open a breach. First of all, we had to get rid of the terrible mortgage of fate, fear. We felt the need for some psychological leap forward. Bookman and his team helped with that, along with many others. Fantastic. Let's give Philip a big round of applause. Everybody. Really good. Clearly a lot of preparation into that and a really good analysis of, of that relationship. And also the sense that the mission of this organisation around radical hospitality, that it isn't just about sitting down in a meeting and then going away again. That you know, these people went to co, they met, uh, they were fed, they were watered, they were given space and they were accompanied uh, on the journey at all times to create peace. And I think um, that's some of the founding missions of our organisation uh, too, and that's lived out there and that's you beautifully um, you know the eloquence of which you showed about how we need to carry on doing that when we create peace among the things that we're doing and in preparation for this event I always forget that Schumann was Prime Minister of France he went on to be and um, I, I don't believe in coincidences I sometimes call them God incidences and recently in Parliament I was actually received a delegation of uh, a French Parisian bishop and he's all these fledgling priests had come uh, uh, across to uh, study Thomas More. Um, so I showed them the plaque on Westminster Hall and as you go through St. Stephen's you can see him there arguing with the king about uh, the divorce maybe they could have done with Buckman maybe in, in them days possibly um, and um, afterwards I, I always take the chance to raise Schumann about his beatification canonization uh, and we were having a round table and it was um, uh, it was going very well and the bishop said do you have any questions for us and I said well I'd like to raise uh, Robert Schumann and his beatification process and the bishop was stunned by this question and I thought you know is it too left field for him what, what, what was the matter and his first words were my mother worked for Schumann for 10 years uh, and during the time that he was prime minister and I think that was some God incident in because we'd already began the preparation for this program. So that was great. Philip, thank you uh, ever so much. We're on time. We're doing very well, everybody. So we'll keep this up. Um, I, I just want to say now, as I introduce uh, Lord Morris Glassman, I think I met Morris, I think in 2008, 2009. I was, uh, I'd given up my teaching career and uh, I'd gone to work for a cabinet minister called James Pennell at the time, just running his constituency office. It, it needed running. And... Um, uh, and I was enjoying the job and he, he brought me down to London to actually meet uh, Morris and a guy called Neil Jameson who ran London Citizens and my goodness me I still remember the day and how the um, sleep peeled from my eyes about what they were trying to do in terms of power and relationships uh, and change and strategy and tactics and it, it stuck with me ever since so much so that I actually went working in the field and almost became an MP because of that uh, seminal uh, meeting. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Morris tonight, a, a Labour life peer uh, elected to the House of Lords, elevated to the House mm. of Lords in 2011, uh, uh, an academic who's lectured at St Mary's Twickenham and London Metropolitan University uh, and oversaw their faith and citizenship um, uh, programme, specialises in political philosophy. Perhaps um, best known for the prominent role played in the development of Blue Labour, uh, which seeks to reconnect the modern Labour Party with its foundational values of patriotism, trade unionism, and um, a community uh, ethic. Um, intersections uh, Glassman has um, identified between Catholic social thought, and he won't mind me saying that as a, a Jewish man, he is probably one of the world's uh, leaders in Catholic uh, social teaching uh, thought. So he is my go-to guy in <laughs> Westminster uh, quite often. I do value that relationship. Uh, and so without further ado, it's my great honour to I'd give him a round of applause to encourage him, uh, Lord Morris Glassman. Well, um, thank you, Mike, and I can assure you that the respect is mutual, and also thank you to Trudy 
and to Margaret for this very really generous invitation. Uh, and I will always honour the debt that I have to Catholic social thought. And I'm going to talk about that uh, a bit more today, just to be aware of, of where I am. We've come to the end of this long cycle of this Catholic, Christian Democrat, Social Democrat, European settlement. We can, we can now see the emergence of one aspect, uh, nationalism, which is threatening that in a variety um, of ways. But the question goes deeper, as I will say, uh, because if you look at Co and the establishment of Co, there was exactly a parallel to that, which was the Mount Pelerin meeting, which was brokered by uh, Hayek after the war. He, he published The Road to Serfdom in 1948, and then brought together a group of free market radicals, also in Switzerland, also on a mountainside, every year to, to propagate the ideas which were extremely unfashionable at the time, which we felt very much. So the Mount Pelerin Society, for example, was a huge influence on the Institute of Economic Affairs, which is just around the corner here, which was the bedrock of Thatcherism and the development of uh, radical uh, free market uh, philosophy. And I think part of the tragedy in which we live is that the Mount Pelerin Society turned out to be much more politically durable than the, the Co Society, but it also built this set of international relationships um, in order to to promote um, radical um, market ideas. So what you have at the end of the war at this Schumann moment, um, which is which is also an extremely important moment in the development of the West German state and the ideas around the West German state. So I just want to talk about that. I mean, it, it is significant that Schumann gave a hint of, of a Christian democratic moment in French history where there could be some, which has always been lurking underneath the surface since the revolution, but could never quite find political expression. Um, it's interesting that he called his party, the party that he belonged to, the Popular Republican Movement. Um, but it really was a successor um, to, to those um, French workers associations that emerged after in the 1890s. So what you've got is the extraordinary publication in 1891 of Rerum Novarum, which is the first encyclical by Leo the Thirteenth in 1892, Leo actually wrote a specific reference to to France, calling on French Catholics to engage in the politics of the Republic. It was a really important moment there of a reconciliation between Catholic thought um, and, and Republican thought. But it is very significant that um, that a Christian democratic form of politics disintegrated by 1954-1955. It was, um, it was, it was all over with the division being between um, leftists arguing for a different form of economy and De Gaulle and the nationalists arguing for a much greater uh, priority um, for the state. What was interesting in that circumstance was that neither disputed the central role. Um, of the state, whereas what you had in, in Germany was, was much more significant because whereas France was on the General Security Council, France also was the possessor of a nuclear deterrent, which was extremely important and remains very important now <laughs> in terms of the military balance of power um, in Europe, um, Germany was utterly defeated. And what I would say is, and this is the, you know, this is the key to the, to the Adenauer moment that you're talking about is that the two institutions that emerged out of the war with any degree of integrity within German society were the trade unions on the one hand and the Catholic Church on the other. It's interesting, Buchmann was a Protestant, but the Lutheran Church in Germany had, had debased itself under Nazism on the whole. It had gone into alliance um, with the German state. Now, there were 
dissidents within that and and it's really important to talk about Bonhoeffer and that whole uh, that whole tradition um, but nonetheless the main body of the institutional church um, was in some form of of disarray and disgrace um, but the Catholic Church were, was not so you got what you had in Germany after the war was a coalition if you like of the two remaining civic institutions that had any moral legitimacy one was the free trade unions who had been outlawed under the Nazis and persecuted and subordinated um, and that became the basis of the SPD of the Social Democratic Party there and the other was the Catholic Church which became very much the social basis of the Christian Democratic Party and the means through which there could begin to be a reconciliation um, there between um, capital and labour is, is because Christian democracy as I will now say um, is very misunderstood in you know in English terms, we can't really understand it um, because of our conception of, of left and right and right meaning somehow being pro-market and left being somehow pro-state, that wasn't how it was uh, at all, um, is that there was a, a great deal of consensus between them and this is what I want to talk about in relation to uh, to to Schumann and and in relation to the Iron and Coal Treaty, which was the foundation of the European Union, which was a genuine um, masterpiece, I think, of these Christian democratic ideas in relationship with social democracy. So what I would say, Philip, is that the reason for Schumann's feeling of desolation was his isolation within the French politics, it is, is that there was a huge ideological, cultural and institutional ecology emerging in Germany which he could completely relate to around unions, around the centrality of the church, the importance of Christian democracy and I will talk about those ideas while within France that was diminishing between a huge polarisation between right and left um, which left him politically um, isolated. So this is what I want to talk about in terms of the Iron and Coal Treaty, how magnificent that was, um, you could almost call it. I think if they're looking for the canonization of Schumann, you could almost call it miraculous within the frame of the time. If they're looking for miracles, um, look there. Uh, because if you actually look in depth at it, it will astonish us what was embodied in this. So let's just look very briefly at what were going uh, Joseph from Rerum Navarum through um, up until that point. Um, this is before the magnificent restatements of that uh, by John Paul II, which I urge you all to engage with, which is Laborum Exercens on Human Work, which is a masterpiece of an encyclical that cannot I cannot convey that I think it's the most profound reflection on labour, on what it means to, on the centrality, the moral centrality of, of work uh, that I've read in secular or religious terms. I, I really think it's, it's magnificent. But then Centesimus Annus, which was published in 1981 um, on the anniversary of Rerum Novarum, um, it is equally superb if you want to look at these ideas more deeply. But let's just look at how radical and conservative these ideas are, just to muck our heads up when we try to look at things through our own ideological prism. Um, the first is the centrality of the status of the human labourer, of the human worker. So there's the centrality, the, you're right, mate, it's human dignity, but what Pope Leo said, um, and what was really hugely understood after the war when they reflected on what were the causes of the rise of Nazism. You know, people had to reflect on that. And certainly it was understood that the abandonment of working class people during the depression to unemployment and poverty led to this enormous polarization between communism and Nazism within Germany. 
So the status of the worker had to be defended as an absolute central priority. I'm talking about the formation of the Iron and Coal Treaty, the, the, the Schumann masterpiece. And central to this is that the human being is not a commodity. Now, Mike will be aware, we both work within labour, that you know, working closely with the with church and with faith is not always very popular. No. You know, I was accused of complicity with all manner of things, sexual abuse, patriarchy, the general oppression of the people of the world. But I used to say to Labour Party meetings, well, at least people of faith don't think that the free market created the world. You know, at least there's something prior and antecedent to that in that God created the world and therefore there's something sacred in this world and fundamentally that is creation itself which is human beings and their natural environment and this is the magnificence of catholic social thought is that it tries to protect the human being and the natural environment now you used a ugly word earlier mike which i've forgotten now but i'll use one but it's gone six o'clock so i think i'm allowed to use it which is commodification which is the idea that happens under capitalism, you've got to understand the deep structure of all this, is that the goal of capital is to turn creation into a commodity. So that's the labor market, that's the food market, that's the housing market, is to turn creation itself into a fluctuating commodity prices subject to market forces. Now what's amazing with the Iron and Coal Treaty, which I would argue, Philip, was really a manifestation of a wider agreement within the Bundesrepublik at the time concerning the political economy. So whereas you've rightly emphasised the relationships, the political components going on there, I would like to emphasise more that there was a shared understanding here rooted in Catholic social thought about the non-commodity status of the human being that 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 was absolutely uh, vital and that's manifest in in the work that schumann did in his analysis of nazism the central role he played um, in the in analyzing the insecurity and precarious nature of the existence of working class people in germany and in france um, during that period of the 1920s and the 1930s now, one really neglected aspect of this, Mike, is uh, this is a, now I'm going to be really wicked and make an internal point uh, about the British occupation of West Rhine, Westphalia, which was the German industrial heartland. Now, my lot in Labour really got beaten in the, we were good. We were good until the sort of early 1930s where we got absolutely trounced by a bunch of academics, Fabians and social planners. <laughs> um, we had ideas, you know, we had ideas. They always hear you, the Fabians, are just over here. Yeah, they always hear me, yeah. I, uh, I, I always say euthanasia and Stalinism, guys, deal with it. Um, they never reply. They hear, but they don't reply. Um, but until that point, um, the labor movement was actually committed to a quite decentralized system based on worker participation. Um, certainly if you look at the plans for for what they called the social ownership of the railways, uh, please come in. Um, it's, it's really the most boring bit of the talk. I'm talking about labor history in the 1930s. Um, what it was, was worker participation in the co-governance of industry uh, a greater degree of, of local control. Now, the biggest advocate of this was a politician, and it's really interesting, Philip, about foreign ministers, because the British foreign minister was Ernest Bevin. Ernest Bevin was essentially the founder of the Transport and General Workers' Union, which became, which we now know as UNITE. At the time, it was the biggest union in the world. Uh, it was uh, Democrat and Ernest Bevin was absolutely committed to all of these ideas and developed a whole range of economists around him. Um, but it came, you know, we've got it next week, Michael, you'll feel the same grief. It, 
it came to the Labour Party conference in 1933 and the way elections worked then was that the unions wielded a huge number of votes. So when I say that, you know, five million people voted for Bevin's plan, but five million and fifty thousand voted for the Fabian plan, it was essentially then we went to a centralised nationalisation system, then we went to a centralised state welfare system. These other ideas were lurking. Bevin kept them on. And so it's a completely neglected aspect of British statecraft that in the North Rhine-Westphalia region, these essentially what we now understand as Christian democratic ideas were institutionalised. Let's just talk about what they were. The first one was that in any business of o employing over 50 people, a third of the seats on the governing body went to the workforce through direct election <coughs> called co-determination. So that meant that the workforce played a central role in the management and organisation of the company. That was also accompanied by the institutionalisation of works councils. This was huge in the mining and steel um, um, industries, where there was essentially uh, forms of self-government, worker self-government going on within those things. In that region, it was the case that you could not work unless you'd been through in a huge wide variety of um, of the working life which would astonish us without going through an apprenticeship. There was a huge stress on vocation, apprenticeship and training. So there was no free labour market access. And that was within a banking system that was local and sectoral. I, you weren't allowed to lend outside the region that the bank was in, at Sparkassen, and there was also um, sectoral banks that could not lend outside. In other words, um, what this system that was adopted within the Iron and Coal Treaty under Schumann was workers having power in the organisation of the firm, an entirely unionised workforce, no free labour market access without going through um, the apprenticeship system within a banking system where it was absolutely constrained both locally and sectorally. And you add into that that it wasn't only pig steel that was affected by this, but pig farming. You know, the, the subsidies to keep small household farms from being bought up by, by others. So you can understand here now, Margaret, I'm looking at you, I'm going on a bit. Oh, right. But I think this is the central thing about what I'm trying to say is that the central aspect of the peace, the central aspect of the reconciliation was between, was not exclusively between France and Germany, but between capital and labour within the organisation of the iron and coal industries that were under their control. And this led to a generalised system. So I just want to go, so the first principle of this form of Christian democracy was, as I say, the status or the dignity of labour. The second idea was, was subsidiarity, which means that power should be exercised at the most local level possible, um, which led to, in Germany, the federal system and the integrity of the, the cities and the self-governing institutions, including um, a free church, of, of the church being able to govern itself. So it had that aspect. And the third aspect um, was solidarity, which meant that there was an obligation institutionalized from the state, whereby the rich did redistribute money to the poor, that there was an obligation of solidarity um, within that. So what I understood of, of all of this was the incredible miracle of the post-war settlement um, was that it understood as a matter of ideological principle that there was a problem with the dominion of capital, that that dominion could only be resisted effectively by then comes the maritime aspect, by forms of democratic local organisation. And this is where we met, was... <laughs> Without that local organisation, Maritain and a guy called Saul Linsky, who set up community organising in Chicago in the 30s, were engaged in a very intense correspondence 
um, around this, and that's why it was called Christian Democracy, because there was a, such a strong aspect on on the local participation of people and them having the power to affect things. And, you know, I said to Margaret in the Zoom that, you know, you've got to be very careful. If you invite an academic to speak, they go over. <laughs> but if you invite an academic who's also a politician to speak, we go way over. <laughs> so I'm understanding all of that. I just wanted to really share with you that now we reach a moment where these both these Christian democratic and social democratic ideas are being overwhelmed. Overwhelmed by globalization, overwhelmed by nationalism, these two contradictory forces, that we've lost the idea of the social, we've lost the idea of societal um, solidarity, we've lost any faith in trusting local people and working class people to govern their own lives. We, yuck, but really that's the very centre of this um, post-war consensus. I urge you to read uh, Maritair on all of that. And what you have now is the beginning of the dissolution of the Franco-German reconciliation, because the unresolved issue there was Germany remained incredibly weak militarily. So France was the leader within that of the European military um, response, but Germany was actually still subordinated to NATO, which was under American um, leadership, fundamentally, um, also British. And I think that ne there was one area where there was no reconciliation, and we now taste its bitter fruits, which was in relation to Russia, is... is there was no co for Russian Western European conversation. Um, with the incredible imposition on Russia of free market fantasy economics with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, you now see the proof. So the big thinker for me here, and I'll end here, Mike and Margaret, as you could see, I could go on is Karl Polanyi in his book, The Great Transformation. That's an incredibly, I just can't urge enough how that when a society, a market storm hits a society, they turn for solidarity wherever they can. And the predominant mode of that would be nationalism, to look to the state and look to national forms of solidarity. Um, I think we're witnessing that now all over Europe. Um, and we really desperately need to return to this wisdom of these post-war years so beautifully articulated by you, Philip, in your paper. So thank you. Extraordinary, powerful, he puts, uh, Morris, hitting the big three there of Christian democracy in terms of human dignity, solidarity, and subsidiarity. I, I won't be prophetise party politics, but uh, a lot of this week is about whether we have government should impose or take away the right for councils to introduce 20 mile an hour limits and um, whether you're a car driver or not a car <laughs> driver the, the principle that governments are, are, are acting at that level to me is very very uh, strange and don't worry it happens on my side of the aisle uh, oh. all the time as our side of the aisle uh, all the time uh, as well um, and it's been a lonely struggle it has been it is a lonely struggle uh, at times and um the the idea of the commodification as well i mean i We've talked about I of C values here, but creationism, as you said, is probably through all religions, you know, Hinduism, Muslim, all, all the great Abrahamic religions and the other religions all have an idea of creationism. Of the sacred. Of the sacred uh, part of the world. And I really think integral ecology is some, will be a source as cli the climate changes of peace and conflict. And, you know, that may be a space at one time we want to uh, get uh, into. But that, that was absolutely fantastic, uh, Morris. Right. We are now a few minutes behind schedule. Um, Apologies. No, not at all. Uh, I could have listened uh, to that all night long. Um, 
This is going to be uh, slightly different from the practice we've had before. I'll be quick and brutal. I need you to uh, participate. You will have 10 minutes and I'll explain what we're going to do. The Jewish theologian Martin Buber um, said that when questioned about where does God exist in the synagogue, the mosque, uh, the church, the temple, said that God exists in the space between people and that is a concept of solid solidarity that we all exist on a plane of um, selflessness to selfishness uh, and how do we bring all those spirits down to the point of contact on that line and we do that by building relationships uh, one on one and uh, that's what we're going to try and do for about 10 uh, minutes or so. That's not long enough. Each of us has a story. Each of us has fears, hopes, dreams. Um, and whether you can convey that in 10 minutes to one another uh, will be very difficult. But I want to just tell your partner when I uh, pair you up in just a second, those quick dreams, you'll have a minute or two uh, at that. And we need to look at it in the context of what we're trying to do tonight. The, the schism over Europe within our country has been huge and it continues. And what would be the space for initiatives of change um, to you know, bridge that divide, that schism? Um, so think about how we could um, bridge that schism when you've told your stories. And also in that time, think of the question you want to ask the panellists here because we'll have 10 minutes for questions after that. So here we go. If you are online, um, the Sam here is going to put you in a room you'd, with somebody to have that conversation with for 10 minutes, okay? Tell them your story. You only have a minute or so oh, for so that. Could I, could I just add it? Go. Really helps. What was the thing that I said that you hated most? Yeah. Discuss that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Morris has thrown that in. Yeah. Uh, and you'll be paired up for about 10 minutes. And we're going to do that physically in the room. So it's best to do it with somebody you don't know. Don't do it with somebody you've been married to for 40 years, okay? Uh, find somebody in the room you well, don't getting up and... know. It may, may mean getting up and moving, okay? Uh, and we're going to start that process now, and I'm going to call you back at um, 10 past 7 for those questions-ish and to uh, draw you back, and it gives the, the panel a chance just to uh, refresh as well. Off you go. <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much. Um, in all my years of doing um, organizing in this fashion, usually the hardest thing is actually to stop people um, talking to one another at this stage. Uh, and uh, But the people online, thank you so much uh, for that as well. Unfortunately, uh, you were timed out. You had to come back uh, to the main room and uh, uh, that's great. But people have gathered around uh, now uh, again. So I hope you found that uh, process of building a relationship with somebody and looking at those specific questions of what did you not like about what Morris said. <laughs> Don't focus on that too much though. Uh, and how, what could initiatives uh, you know, do in terms of this space and peace as well, or questions that you had to either Morris or Philip. So um, who's going to go, uh, for the people online, you've got the chat box because uh, you can't come in unfortunately but if you put in the chat box your comments or questions Trudy will in a few minutes I'll bring her in to give us a synopsis of what you're saying online so that you are participating fully uh, but for those in the room uh, who would like uh, to contribute uh, now and on the basis that you have you've discussed this I should see all hands going up uh, straight away. Great. Krish, thank you uh, ever so much. Uh, Krish, uh, our, our great facilitator here at Initiatives. Do you want to stand up and uh, and let us know? Yeah, well, thank you so much for a really stimulating uh, panel. Um, my question was, to what extent has capitalism and nationalism appropriated uh, the methodology of Saul Alinsky and indeed Schumann and others uh, now? That's my question. Fantastic, Chris. And if you don't know uh, Saul Alinsky, as Morris said, he was a community organizer in Chicago, um, 
paid for by churches and Christian movements, um, talked about power, uh, in fact, that the first community organizer was the devil himself because he took power from God uh, in the fall. <laughs> Might not go down too well that, uh, but um, he, it, it was a real concept of how uh, individuals and groups coming together takes power back from the state. Morris, I'll let you go first on that um, one. Okay, so there's, Chris, there's two two stages to the to the answer uh, and the first one is that i'll say is to invert the usual understanding is is that only where there's a way is there a will okay and what we've had is the disintegration of both the socialist or social democratic conception of the economy that it's inefficient that it doesn't work that it's incapable um and you've also had a simultaneous dissolution um, of the um, Christian democratic system. I mean, the disintegration. In that way, Schumann was uh, a canary in the mine. That was all over by 1954. What's happening in Germany now is, I mean, social democracy and Christian democracy have been wiped out in, in Holland, in Italy. Um, absolutely. I mean, there used to be between the Communist Party and the and the Christian Democrats real huge layers of mutual understanding in terms of local government redistribution, um, all gone. Um, and and so that there's um, so the only two things with energy are things that are funded by very rich people about capitalism, and then the refuge for that is you know, is this thing we call populism. And I just want to dissent. I don't, you know, what I see is that any time anybody criticizes capitalism, they're called a populist. This is what I see um, going on. So there's this desperate attempt to, pervert, to preserve this failing status quo. Now, within that, what you have, so organizing is it's really, as I say, this, this Maritain Alinsky uh, letter exchange is extremely important one uh, for me, really, really very interesting, is that what Maritain understood was that, and this is what we're living through, is, is that as society becomes increasingly dominated by these two institutions, the state and the market, society disintegrates. And you see it in declining church numbers, in the disintegration of wider you know, is, is that's the only place that people really join together in communion these days is really football matches. You know, is this passionate identification and, you know, well, Liverpool's goal wasn't really offside. <laughs> and I support Spurs and that was good. But what I'm saying is, is that I don't get that feeling anywhere else anymore. I used to get it in politics. You know, the people would come together and that sense of solidarity and that sense of connection, and that's completely commodified. That's all private companies completely preying upon people's ancestral memories of, of belonging. So, Chris, what you've got is that these organising, on the one hand, it's a method, and that could be used by anybody, and that method is relationships, power, action, that you must build relationships before you begin to act and those rela it, there's money power there's state power the only power that ordinary people have got is in their relationships and strengthening those relationships now they have been appropriated entirely um on on but by nationalists and by capitalists not so successfully really by the labor movement yeah. in fact yeah. which was the actual origin of a huge amount of all of this so there's there's a there's an irony in the in the story, yeah. So what they can do is they can appropriate the method, but they can't appropriate the fundamental ideological or moral idea, which is that there's no alternative to ordinary people finding each other and negotiating their way. So that's my experience when I met my, I'd just done eight years on living wage. And 
basically what we found was you bring together Catholics and Protestants and Muslims and Hindus and secularists, you're not going to get any common agreement on abortion. You're not going to get any common ag agreement even on the nature of creation. But you are going to get a common agreement that people should be paid a decent amount of money if they work. So that was the living wage came out of a consensus building I did. Then we had the, you know, after the crash, do you remember the, I mean, it was incredible. The, uh, the banks were borrowing at half a percent and the poor were borrowing at 5,000 percent. It was really straightforward organizing work and it brought huge, mm. but you just have to, you, you've got to be able to, to get the people together and get the position that it comes from them. So that's, I'm just and I, raising the organizing point. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's really good. And I, I'd also add the point that many of the people in this room and online are involved in their own congregations, churches, mosques, synagogues. Don't forget, if you've got 100 or 200 people who come together every week, you are the most powerful civil society institution in your community. Yeah. So you, you have far more power than you often think that you, you have as a the, the point I would make. More questions. We've got a few more minutes. This gentleman here at the front, what's your name? And uh, my name's William Here, William, here's the microphone. Uh, my name is William Nkata. I'm a member of uh, oh, the Initiative of Change. Um, I've graduated from here to be one of the refugees as builders. Um, my question is about uh, um, how could you justify that we need to roll back the frontiers of social capital and our social democratic values and Christianity values? Um, uh, and if Frank was here today, how could he fault globalization? Thank you. <coughs> That's a great question. I don't think I've got an easy solution to that. Um, he was, he tended to try to take the currents of the day and inject a moral and spiritual component into them. So I don't think he would have said, we, we need to stop globalization, but we need to find a way of building relationships between people of different countries. Um, one of the th striking things about many of the traveling groups which were with initiatives of change is that they involved people from uh, publicly from different cultures. So he was trying to demonstrate the existence of a world community. So I suppose he was trying to say there could be such a thing as a world community uh, if, if, if globalization is, is sort of approached in a different way, not from a purely economic um, approach. Um, and of course, Schumann was trying to do that with his concept of a supranational association of countries. Um, so you can't you can't always stop certain processes, but you can give them a different character. That's what I think he would say. Um, but he was not a theorist, Bookman. Um, he was he was he was or, or he, he, he was a thinker in a way, but he was not a sort of theorist. So he would always be. He would probably say to you, so excited by your involvement, how can you be a bridge builder better? So he would, he would immediately bring it back to you. Um, and there's your challenge, William. Refugees as rebuilders. Morris, yes, Morris. I'm just going to ruin the evening, I think. <laughs> um, I've got a really nice feeling from the room, but everything is going to change now. Um, so it's just to let you know that I campaigned for Brexit, but I was really because I think that the EU had become an instrument for the imposition of a non-democratic capitalist form of globalization. That the EU flipped from this glory, this miracle of the coal and steel treaty with its dignity of work, with its subsidiarity, with its um, solidarity into essentially an instrument for which there could be no democratic resistance to capital. Um, I'm just sharing that with you. So. Um, that was actually a, a, a very big experience. I'm, that's why I said it was a very generous invitation today because I know a lot of people who are still not talking to me. Um, and it was, it was very, very um, 
very ugly. But the key point is 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 about what you're saying is that this globalization has been used as an ideology to say that there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no ability, it's fate, it's destiny, it's technology, it's the... But this is not the case. We can now see the disintegration. You can see the confrontation between the United States and China is beginning. We can see, um, certainly in terms of the war in Ukraine, the building of different poles of trading. And what's needed is to go back to these original ideas and say, you know, it's not to be forgotten that, that Schumann said that the Europe that this wasn't called the European Union then, that this was supposed to be a union of free peoples. You know, that was the phrase that that um that he used. And central to that was a political system that did not commodify human beings and their natural environment and allowed for a democratic accountability. Um that's what so what's essentially happened, just to answer your question, is that the Christian Democrats dissolved into the market, the Social Democrats dissolved into some kind of legal statist, and everybody abandoned the power of democracy to actually answer people's needs and, and lives. So, sorry to spoil your evening, but what's necessary is an absolute resistance to this globalizing fate that this is the way it is, when it's completely in the interests of the rich. That's how it works. I could go on, but I'll just leave it there. And can I just invite Trudy for a second now? Have we had feedback from our online guests today? I'm not sure, because not I need sure. to check my we'll, phone. We'll check on it. <laughs> While she's doing that, I'll, just, I'll make the point that I made in a... Is, is there anybody else with a burning question here? Yes. And there's somebody at the back too. Yeah, and Alison at the back. I'll go for it, Amina, and then we'll come here to the front. Hello, everybody. Good evening. I'm Amina, uh, the head of Sustainable Communities. And I want to pick up on uh, Philip's comments around um, that Frank Bookman was not a theorist, but a man of action. And I was particularly reflecting back on what that means. So I recently, uh, less than three, four weeks ago, I recently moved to Nottingham part-time. And uh, last week, of course, we celebrated one of the most important days in the UN calendar, International Day of Peace. And apart from two or three people that I knew in that city, everything else was very new to me. And as part of Sustainable Communities um, engagement, every year we host an event to commemorate that special day. And uh, the step that I took was to do some serious door knocking and introduce myself to the community. And then through that, we organized a peace walk whereby over 20 people, apart from the three people that I knew, joined in, into that peace walk with us, uh, reflecting on the importance of uh, community building, trust building, and uh, what International Peace Day means to each one of us. One of the counselor had joined us and actually cancelled one of her prior meetings through to that. So reflecting back on what each one of us needs to do and going from theory to practice, what steps can we take in these challenging times to practice and make an impact like Frank Buckman did? Thank you, Marina. <coughs> um, we'll take this, uh, this lady at the front as well, Joseph, if that's okay, and then we'll bring uh, Trudy in. On, we'll answer them questions and then bring Trudy in. Yep. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Sophie Case. I am a human rights activist. Um, and thank you so much for tonight. It's been fascinating to hear, and the parallels with today's uh, world is, is extraordinary, really. Um, my question is actually very similar to what Am Amita Amina, sorry, Amina was saying, so could, could you give us a bit of hope? What, what do we do? So on grassroots level, policy, do we take, do we need to change curriculum at schools or where do we take the, this, these ideas to make sure that, you know, we don't give up at least on the next generations? 
Okay, Amina and Sophie, thank you for that. I think that's all about action. And thank you for your action as well, Amina. Uh, we're a UN organisation as well, looking at the sustainability goals. We were the only organisation that put on a refugee day in Parliament, and we're putting on a peace day in Nottingham. What? How do we take action, Morris? Okay, so I take a, a strict orthodox view on this. Um, and the first assumption is that we're in this disintegration of the old, that... So, I mean, for example, in terms of the Russia-Ukraine war, Russia is on the Security Council of the UN and it's done absolutely nothing to reconcile or create peace. We've got a... This is not um, pessimism. This is just understanding straightforwardly... You understand what my view is now of that the European Union has become the absolute opposite of what it was founded for, right? So that's, however, the hope always lies in the people that are around you. Because, thank God, they haven't all been to university and they haven't all been completely lobotomized into some false hope of the, the world is getting, you know. So I always say it's the last thing you want to hear when you go to the doctor, it's progressive, you know. Um, <laughs> Um, that they still have some sense of belonging, they've got sense of obligation to family, they've got some sense of obligation to, to country, to colleagues. Um, so this is what I say to you, is the time you spend meeting someone that you don't know and potentially don't like, you know, someone who you consider that you, in your recesses of your soul, that you demonise as a horrible, those are the people you've got to go and talk to and build relationship with. I mean, this is, in fact, the deep Buchmann story. That's the whole thing with the organizing is, so, Amina, you know, my experience of this, which is lifelong, is the first 10 minutes are difficult. You hear all manner of stuff, and your desire is to end the conversation immediately on a matter of principle. But once you've got through the hate and the rage, it's great. So my, my genuine advice to, to you and to everybody who asks me is don't feel contempt for poor people. Go and talk to them and love them. That's what I'm saying. Very right. good. I'm so unused to applause, that's kind of taken me by surprise. Uh, Trudy, we're right up against time now, Trudy. What, what feedback have we had from yeah, we've the got, guests online? We've got lots of questions, so thank you everybody online. Um, we will forward these on, um, but I'm selecting this one um, from Will and Angela Elliott, and they are saying, is there any way that local responsibility can, can function now when we have economies so intertwined globally? And that's actually something that myself and Roddy were talking about just earlier in our 10-minute chat. Local, global. Well, I, I, I'm actually just going to finish ask, answering the previous question, if I may, very, very quickly, Mike, uh, but which is that uh, just as the... In Bookman would also say there's an interior step, uh, the, 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 the kind of... The, the finding the inspired step outwardly, which Amina is aspiring after, sometimes comes from an interior step, and that's why I kind of in, hinted at the still small voice image from the Book of Kings. Oh, yeah. You know, all the noise, um, if, you, if you're stilled and, and let the kind of noisy stuff pass, uh, sometimes you get a sense of what is the creative step I'm meant to take. Um, and then it might be the step which Morris has just said. I, actually, where it, where it touches me is a particular difficult relationship I have or... Um, or uh, um, something that I'm, I have a sense I should do, but I've been putting off. Yeah, that um, one. Uh, you know, you know so, somewhere it, it, if we make space to hear that voice, we know what the step is. And that, I think Bookman would say, um, so Bookman would say definitely there's hope in every situation for that still small voice to come into play. And I would just develop that, amplify that bit. So... The, the fundamental assumption that animates um, Christian democracy, certainly, it does come from Aristotle and it goes through Aquinas and it goes through um, all that, which is that we are social beings, we're not, in, yeah. you know, that we are damaged by this liberalism that prizes individual, 
autonomy above love, obligation, trust, truth, that, that, that somehow you know, we've got into a world now where the legal system upholds a really radical individual subjectivity. That's often, by the way, identified with human rights as well, which leads to political mayhem. Um, so this still small voice is one thing, but I'm really interested in the idea of being together with other people and being quiet. Mm. You know, yeah. there's a big difference between being on your own and being quiet and actually sharing space with others. And what you hear when you do that is, is, is something really, um, really interesting. And another thing that oh, well, IOC way, does quite well is spending time contemplating. Yeah, I've just, I, I just realised that I didn't. So what I'm saying to the people who asked the question is, you know, there is power. We've been told this thing about the global economy and there's nothing you can do. And then we found out in COVID that there was loads we could do, right? <laughs> Suddenly, all of that turned out not to be true. And then we had to recognise, oh, we've subcontracted our entire industry to China, which has no free trade unions, no free religion, is really a very wicked and oppressive state. And we are completely dependent on them for face masks. You know, we've got to ask some questions here that are political questions about um, industrial strategy, productive autonomy. These are now questions that are on the people's minds. But the more we say to them, there's nothing you can do, the more contempt they will have for the political class and how we behave. And we run up against, oh, I could go on. This, oh, this, go on. No, no. Um, because we want to keep on building the relationships in the room outside for the next 20 minutes uh, as well and getting to know one another. So I think it's been an absolutely tremendous sort of intellectual and practical uh, evening. And I'm really grateful to each and every one of you who've participated both in the room tonight uh, and online. Uh, I think it's a real food for thought. I think it's food for thought for all of us in this organisation about what space we want to be in and how we revert back to principle in terms of our organising and a number of our uh, projects organisers are here tonight uh, as well and I think it's been fantastic with it so my grateful thanks to Philip uh, and to Morris can we show our appreciation please through a hand clap and a wave online if we've got it that's been great uh, my personal thanks to all the organisers today. I will name some people. If I've forgotten anyone, please forgive me. But Trudy and Sam in the, the comms team and Joseph as well. Uh, to Keith uh, and, the, the, and Bernie and the hospitality team uh, who've worked really hard. To our engineers and photographers tonight as well. This will be has been recorded, will be online. Uh, Joseph and I were just saying outside that we want to make sure we've got all those book references that you've uh, both told us that we've got to read. And we will, uh, we'll make transformation. By yeah, God the transformation. Yeah, yeah. We will make sure uh, that happens. And with that, that, that's it from me. It's my great pleasure now to just introduce uh, uh, Margaret once again uh, to conclude the night. Uh, Margaret, you've said it all, Mike. This is what the politicians do for you. Uh, but but just thank you so much to to Philip and to Morris and to Mike for for an absolutely fascinating evening, I think all of us. I'm only sorry that we didn't have the time. I was dying to know what the questions from on online were. Um, I'm almost wanting to say, send them in and we'll, we'll ask our panel to you know, make observations in the report that we do. Um, but just thank you very much uh, for coming. It's been, it's been fun. It's been and, and just enlightening and interesting and, um, uh, let's let's have yes. Uh, so the 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 theme one of the central themes of initiatives of change is we take one step, and so if as we go out today we can think of just take one step against this background of um, my partner uh, who was talking to me, Judy, commented on the fact that um, there was not a lot made. There we are. You wanted a complaint, Morris? You're getting a complaint. Um, there was not a lot said about the enormous trauma that Europe 
uh, went through at the end, you know, during World War II and 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 after the war, and the 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 extent of the the bitterness and hatred that lay between the countries, and th so the miracle of um, of the work that Schumann did, which deserves beatification, many of us feel, uh, is you know we, we didn't come out to the ex to to the extent of the horror that that and, and the depth of, of feeling, uh, but just thank you, and um, and let's go and continue the conversation outside.